As always, if you have any questions or you need me to pause or repeat something, please either unmute or pop it into the chat. Um, so we have, this is the upper limb joints PowerPoint from Dr. Austin. I just downloaded. Okay. Uh, so some terms, joints versus dislocation, articulation, luxation, subluxation, reduction or reduced ligament tendon and epiphyseal. Um, does she go into actually give you the, no, she does not, okay. Um, so some of these terms I can actually give you some definitions for just to start off. Um, so obviously the joint is like a meeting of two bones and articulation is how those bones like move with each other. Dislocation is when you have the joint is out of alignment. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Subluxation, we saw that before with subluxation of, um, of uh, the radius coming out of the angular, angular ligament um, and how it was aligned with the humerus. Uh, reduced or reduction is when you put that bone back into alignment. So a reduction is the opposite of a dislocation. Ligament is when you have bone connected to bone, so it's the actual tissue that's connecting bone to bone, versus a tendon is when you connect muscle to bone. And uh, epiphyseal is the end of the bone where the bone is actually growing. And so you'll see this in um, children and teenagers because you actually don't grow from like the center of your bones, you grow from the ends and they get like elongated. So usually it's called the epiphyseal plate. Um, as far as luxation, not quite sure what that means. <laughs> okay, what is wrong with this picture? Okay, so you can see here, like when you're looking at an x-ray, there's entire schemes that people use for uh, trying to gather data from it. Like you can look up the different mnemonics. I never really learned them. Um, the only thing that I really learned was make sure you look outside and then come in and don't just look at the thing that's obviously wrong because there could be other problems too. Um, but anyway, for this particular x-ray, we can see how this is the humerus and this is the cupulinal humeral joint and how it is dislocated. So the bone itself has popped out of its joint and has dropped down. So this is a dislocation of the glenohumeral humeral joint. Um, and recall that when you have a dislocation like this, you could possibly damage your axillary nerve as well as your posterior circumflex humeral artery because they're traveling around that surgical neck of your humerus. Um, and you can see here, like it's already labeled pre-reduction radiograph showing subglenoid inferior dislocation with humerus parallel to the chest wall. So this is the actual like medical term for you have a dislocation of your humerus, dislocation of your arm. So the joints um, for this particular area that we need to talk about. So there's the glenohumeral humeral joint, which is humerus to the glenoid fossa of the scapula. You have um, articulation between your sternum and your clavicle here. So this is another joint, your sternoclavicular joint. And then you have articulation. It's not shown very well, but it's in like the back here. Well, I guess this will count. Um, so the acromial clavicular joint. So remember the acromion is that part of the clavicle where it curves around and it like meets with the lateral end of your clavicle. So it's the acromial clavicular joint. And then you also have um, the coracoclavicular uh, joint here. So, or coracoclavicular ligament. Because the whole point here is that you have your clavicle and then you have your coracoid process of your scapula. And there's two different ligaments here that are connecting the clavicle with this um, coracoid process. So you can see how all of these together, they're able to move somewhat and they're able to have that flexibility um, while still staying connected because of the ligaments. Um, so some of these ligaments you will need to memorize. So let's just talk about them now in this picture. So the ones that really came up for questions when I was learning about them was the coracoclavicular ligament because there is two separate ligaments here um, that make up this collective ligament. So you have the trapezoid right here and you have the conoid right here. And together, like these two separate ligaments, when you 
call them together as a unit, they are the Coraco clavicular ligament. Um, the super acromial clavicular ligament, I don't remember if I learned that as a separate ligament. I just remember learning it because it is the connection between the lateral portion of your clavicle with the um, acromion of your scapula. And then your um, glenohumeral joint, how it is created by, like it's a fibrous capsule that's created by ligaments coming off of um, the, well, excuse me, yeah, ligaments coming off of the muscles, like your sits muscles to help to encapsulate the area. So remember your four sits muscles because they're all gonna be involved in that. Um, as well as the long head of your biceps uh, brachii. So the tendon actually goes through into the capsule and then attaches at the superior portion of uh, the joint. So let's see, I'm trying to think, was there any other important ones that I needed to know? Uh, your costoclavicular ligament, I vaguely recall that coming up. So a lot of these ligaments in the name, they're gonna tell you what they're connecting. So costoclavicular, if you ever see costo, costo is your prefix for a rib. So costoclavicular is telling you that you have an attachment um, between a rib and the clavicles. So you can see here how this ligament is attaching between the medial portion of your clavicle to the first rib. So your costoclavicular ligament. Um, as opposed to the articular disc of your sternoclavicular joint, well, you can once again, breaking up down the names here, sterno for your sternum and then clavicular for your clavicle. So the articular disc that is between your sternum and your clavicle. Um, I don't know if she's gone into this yet with y'all, but the manubrium is the top part of your sternum. Your sternum actually has three parts. There's the manubrium at the top, then there's the body, and then down at the bottom, there's this little projection at the bottom, like sort of like a teardrop projection. That is your xiphoid process. But yeah. So that's your sternum. It sort of looks like, like the bow tie of bones. Um, but I believe those were all of the important ligaments that I can recall getting tested on. Okay. Saddle joint articular disc, or orientation plate. Mm. What about this is important? Okay, so this is showing you a little bit more um, in-depthly the joint between your sternum and your clavicle. You can see again that articular disc of the sternoclavicular joint here, as well as articular cavities of the sternoclavicular joint. So you have the actual disc and then you have the space between the two bones and that gives you um, some flexibility, allows for some movement. Saddle joint is like a type of joint where um, so you can see how in this picture, uh, the top of the sternum, the manubrium is acting as a saddle and then the medial part of the clavicle is sort of sitting in it. And so you can have like little bits of movement of the clavicle within this area. So like a saddle joint is sort of like that where one bone is sort of sitting in the other and you get movement based on that. For our ribs and for our sternum, why we wanna have some movement there is it's all about breathing. So allowing for some articulation so that the chest wall can expand to allow room for the lungs and gas exchange. Um, I don't know what Hilton's law is. Nerve to subclavius, blah, 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 medial brachial, clavicular nerve, C3, C4. Um, I don't know what these are in reference to. I can tell you that this is the subclavius muscle and obviously nerve to subclavius is the innervation for it um, versus the medial supraclavicular nerve. Well, supraclavicular is going to the posterior aspect of the scapula to do uh, supraspinatus and infraspinatus innervation, but I don't know what, what this particular law is in reference to. Okay. So the glenohumeral joint also known as your shoulder joint. Um, so you can see here, we have peeled away your deltoid muscle. And so we can see better uh, the joint capsule for your humerus that's articulating with your scapula. You can also see here bursa. So I've mentioned this before, bursa are fluid filled sacs that are all over your body um, that are there to help you with friction. And so you especially like it's important um, in joints where you have lots of movement, which your glenohumeral joint obviously is a great example of that. 
Um, you can see how you have the subdeltoid bursa, which is fused with the subacromial bursa. So notice again, when they're naming these, thankfully they made it so that it like points you to where it is. So subdeltoid underneath the deltoid muscle, subacromial underneath the acromion of your scapula. And then there is communication between the two. Um, I know that in some questions they've asked about if you injected fluid into one bursa, like where would it travel? So this is another way, like this is a picture that can show you that if you injected fluid into the subdeltoid bursa, excuse me, it could travel to the subacromial bursa. So there's communication there. I believe there's also a subscapular bursa. We'll see if that comes up. But yeah, oh, and then again, there's your tendon of the long head of the biceps entering into the glenohumeral joint before it attaches on the superior aspect. Okay. All right. Um, what is she trying to show in these pictures? Okay, so there's a clavicle, there's a scapula. Um, I think this is supposed to be showing you the demonstration of the movement of your upper limb within this joint, how you have the articulation between the humerus as well as the scapula and the clavicle here. Um, so the glenohumeral humeral joint is pretty flexible. Um, you can move it, so you can move it front, you can move it anterior, you can move it posterior, you can abduct, adduct. So it has a lot of range of motion. So you remember we have that increased flexibility um, because we have, um, the moderate stability that's offered by our rotator cuff muscles, our sits muscles. Um, again, here you can see the subacromial bursa, although it looks like it's subacromial going into subdeltoid and they haven't made a distinction in this particular picture. Um, I'm trying to think what else would be important here. Um, this is showing you the acromial branch of your thoracoacromial artery. So recall that that is um, the thoracochromial trunk is the artery that has the four branches that remember the branches via decap and the A in decap is a chromial. So you can see that going in and feeding the area. Um, what else? So this is showing you the articulation of the clavicle to your chromion here. So your chromion is that part of the scapula where, remember, if you look at the posterior portion of the scapula, you have the spine and then the spine curves around towards the front. Well, that front curve is your acromion. And you can see here the clavicle is sitting in that joint with the acromion and how it can have like, as the scapula moves, it can articulate. So the acromion articulates with the clavicle so it can move anteriorly or posteriorly. And then again, here's your core cord process that's underneath another projection coming off of the scapula. And they're just giving you an idea of like when you're moving the scapula, how it's gonna articulate with the clavicle, both uh, where the acromion is, but also because the coracoid process is here, you have the cracoclavicular ligament that's allowing for articulation as well with the clavicle here. Okay. All right, so this is an even more detailed picture um, of the different ligaments for your glenohumeral joint. So again, here's the tendon of the long head of the biceps entering into the joint. Um, you have the transverse humeral ligament here versus the tendon of the supraspinatus. It literally just broke down all the different like little pieces. Um, you have the fibrous capsule itself of the shoulder joint made of the tendons of your sits muscles. And then it's showing you a communication between the synovial cavity and the subtendinous bursa of the subscapularis. Okay, so this is that thing that I remember before. So you can actually have communication from the glenohumeral humeral joint, glenohumeral humeral joint, uh, I can talk today, um, with your subscapularis. So there is a bursa underneath subscapularis and then you will have communication of fluid between this joint as well as beneath your subscapula, subscapularis. Um, I think those are all of the important points. The only other thing of note on this particular picture is you can see like the different parts of the humerus and the clavicle that they wanna point out again, but I think by now you guys all know those parts of those bones. 
Okay, and now we can really see all of the bursa and how they're connected. So remember, here is your subacromial bursa, and then here is the connection, the subtendinous bursa of the subscapularis. So this is that connection of the fluid between the two. So that's how if you inject a dye into the subdeltoid, it can flow into um, the subacromial and then the subtendinous bursa of subscapularis. And again, we can see all those important ligaments from before and their connection of the acromion to the clavicle as well as the core cord process. So you're definitely gonna wanna memorize these since she's featured them multiple times on this PowerPoint. So your caracoacromial and then your caracoclavicular and then your superior acromial clavicular ligament. What's a good way to differentiate those based on like questions and stuff? Like how would she ask it so where we could know which one? Because since they're so closely related. So I know there's a more blue box about this. So it's the dislocation of your shoulder versus dislocation of your clavicle. Um, like there's different distinctions of like if you tear just these ligaments versus if you tear these ligaments, plus you tear this ligament and it's more blue box somewhere. I don't know where, but I know I've seen it before where they've like, they've given it different names. And it all depends on how much, like pretty much how much you've torn the ligaments. But yeah, I can't recall off the top of my head, which is which, um, but yeah, that's how they make the distinction in a question is you understanding like, did they just tear did they just tear the caracoclavicular or did they tear the caracoclavicular as well as the acromioclavicular and the caracoacromial? So I think it has something to do with like dislocation of um, the shoulder, the shoulder joint versus dislocation of your arm would be glenohumeral dislocation where the humerus pops down. What other questions? Yeah, that makes sense. Knowing like, you know, which two bones have been dislocated. Yeah, it's which bones have been dislocated and which um, ligaments have been ripped in like that dislocation. So you can know like the clavicle has been dislocated from the acromion, but the, then you also need to know, okay, so what ligaments were ripped for this to happen? Was it just the was it just the acromial curricular ligament, or did they also rip their coracoacromial, and did they also rip their coracoclavicular? And the number of ligaments, like the degree of damage, is going to depend on how many ligaments they actually ended up ripping. Like it's not as bad when you just have one versus all three of them. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. All right. So now in this picture, they've cut away and we're looking actually inside of the joint capsule of your uh, glenohumeral joint. So you can see how here's the cavity. So like this is the depression in your scapula. And you can see here the glenoid labrum. So this is like the area right around like the glen. So technically when I learned this, I learned it as the glenoid fossa because a fossa is just like a depression inside of a bone. It's sort of like a scooped out area or um, if you would think of uh, putting your thumb in some Play-Doh, like that area that your thumb made is a fossa. So I learned this as the glenoid fossa. And then around it is the glenoid labrum see here um and let's see and then they're just showing you like the different tendons that are helping to make up the capsule so you can see here's subscapularis coming in and then let's see where else um they're showing you the long head of the biceps brachii traveling through so we can attach on the superior aspect um and then they've actually named the different parts of the ligaments. So you have your superior glenohumeral ligament, your middle, middle glenohumeral ligament, and then your inferior glenohumeral ligament. 
And then this is the anatomical neck of the humerus as opposed to the surgical neck down here. So the surgical neck is what we think about for fractures versus the anatomical neck. Um, I just think about that as if you were to just chop off the, the circular head of the humerus, that's where the anatomical neck is. Because remember, you have like that head that's out right here. And then this is the part, like it's that actual head of the humerus that's articulating with the glenoid fossa. Um, let's see. What else is important in this? Uh, you can also see here, like again, all these things are close together. So there's your cracochromial ligament again, um, along with your chromium from your scapula. Um, oh gosh. So synovial fringe. So within a joint, um, one of the things that helps with joint articulation is that the joint actually has fluid inside of it. It's called synovial fluid. It is made by the cells inside of the joint. Um, and it's like, it basically is in there to cushion and reduce friction with movement. Pretty much all of your joints have synovial fluid um, because you need them for that smooth movement, that smooth movement, that gliding. Otherwise, the bones would be um, grinding against each other, and eventually they would wear down. Um, that's part of the problem in osteoarthritis. Is like you put so much wear and tear in it that you've now reduced the synovial fluid, you've reduced the cushioning that's in the joint and now it's bone on bone, bone grinding. Um, so yes, yeah, so when they talk about synovial fringe, that's just telling you, oh right, um, so you have synovial fluid that's going up to this edge um, and that's helping with the cushioning of the joint for the movement into the joint. Okay, and now we're looking at this joint from a different angle again. So this, in this particular picture, they've just completely taken out the humerus and you're looking at the scapula surrounded by its muscles. Um, and then you're looking into the glenohumeral joint. So again, this is the glenoid fossa. So this is a part of the scapula and it has like cartilage on top of it. Um, we're gonna have that synovial fluid. And then it's talking about here. So you have openings for different bursa. So openings to the subtendinous bursa of the subscapularis. Um, you can see here's your subacromial bursa. Um, what else? Um, you can see how the different muscles are arranged in relation to one another. So how the deltoid is superficial to your infraspinatus and your teres minor, which are once again, sits muscles. Um, you can see here's subscapularis coming in. And then let's see, so infra, and then do they show? And oh, then yeah supraspinatus tendon in the capsule of the shoulder. Sounds like where's supraspinatus, but they're showing you the tendon here at the top. Cause like supraspinatus would be further up in here. Um, what else? Cut tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii. Okay, so you can see how like long head, it would come in and attach on the superior aspect. So they actually just like drew a picture where they cut away the tendon. Um, as opposed to like the short head of the biceps brachii, remember that's one of the three muscles that attaches to the coracoid process. So this is like going toward the coracoid process and not really a part of the glenohumeral joint. Um, and then again, mentioning um, the ligaments. So you have the superior ligament, the middle, and then the inner inferior glenohumeral ligament, all helping to make up this joint capsule. And here again is our axillary nerve and our posterior circumflex humeral artery going around like what would be, so you'd have the head of the humerus here and then the um, surgical neck right here. And so the two of them going around the surgical neck here as opposed to the anatomical neck, which would be if you had cut off the humerus while it was still inside of the joint, which is like the head still inside the joint. Um, okay. Okay, so in this picture, they've actually opened up the joint like a book. So you can see better um, the distinction between like, this is the scapular side versus this is the humeral side. So again, um, here's the head of your humerus and it's covered with articular cartilage. Here's your glenoid cavity, glenoid fossa, whichever word you wanna use. Again, covered with cartilage for articulation to help um, with that smooth movement. 
Uh, they've shown you the different uh, sits muscles in this area. So here's your supraspinatus tendon that we saw before. Here's your infraspinatus. Here's your teres minor. And then here's your subscapularis. Again, here's the tendon of the long head of the biceps going to insert on that superior aspect of the glenohumeral joint. Um, here's the glenoid labrum around the joint itself. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's important here. Yeah, I think that's it for this picture. But just giving you a better idea spatially of if you were to cut this joint and open it up at like a book, what would it look like so you can get an idea of where is everything traveling, where is everything located in relationship to each other. Okay, and again, now we've stripped away most of the muscles and we're seeing it um, from the side, so laterally with the humerus taken out. And again, just looking at the way the scapula is arranged, how you have um, that spine that curves around to your acromion, which then articulates with your clavicle, how you have that coracoid process coming off from the front. And I don't know if I told you guys this, but coracoid um, process is like, I think it stands for crow's nest because it sort of just sticks out there like a crow. Um, how you have the different ligaments attached here. So your coraco, coraco humeral ligament. Um, and then there's that tendon and the long head of the biceps brachii attaching to the superior aspect of the glenohumeral joint. Here's your glenoid cavity, and then here's your labrum surrounding it. And then, okay, so here they actually mentioned the long head of your triceps brachii. So remember that's on the posterior aspect of your humerus and it's, um, it's originating here on the lateral border of your scapula. And then it's inserting along with the tendons from your middle and your lateral head of the triceps onto um, the olecranon of the ulna. Okay, and again, spatially, so it seems like she really wants you to know spatially how these muscles are arranged to help form the rotator cuff. Um, so here's your glenoid cavity and then your sits muscles. So your supraspinatus coming over the top, your infraspinatus um, below the spine of your scapula, your teres minor coming up um, inferiorly from all of them. And then your subscapular is coming anteriorly and all together their tendons help to create that rotator cuff. Now, looking at this particular picture, this is again an X-ray of our shoulder um, and our glenohumeral joint. So you can see here is your humerus and it's making the distinction between your surgical neck versus your anatomical neck would be here. Um, this is your shoulder joint itself and how you have, let's see, what are they pointing out here? Oh, they're showing um, the coracoid process. So it's hard to see because x-rays are 2D, but we ourselves, our bodies are 3D. So the coracoid process is more anterior to all of this, but obviously you can't exactly show that in a 2D film. So they're just trying to point out like that's where your corporate process is. Um, you can see the acromium of your clavicle, excuse me, of your scapula curving around to articulate with your clavicle. And then here is the acromial clavicular ligament. Um, so here's your scapula. And then again, remembering that because this is 2D and not 3D, the spine of your scapula like curved around to come here. So that's why they pointed it out that way. Um, what else is important here? Mm. Yeah, so they're showing you here, here's your deltoid muscle. So one of the things about x-rays is that air is gonna show up as black, tissue is gonna show up as gray and bones are gonna show up as more white. Um, especially if they're well calcified or if they're laying on top of each other. So like the stacked, um, like because mo multiple bones are stacked here, that's why this is so white. 
versus there's just a solitary humerus here. So it is still white, but not as white as this area here versus this is muscle and tissue. So it's more gray than then everything outside of it, the air is black. So when you're looking, so later on, put this bug in your ear. And when you're looking at lung films, if it looks black, that's usually good because it means it's full of air. Um, you want it to be black with these little, little spotty hashes in there because that is gonna be the lungs filling with air and then like the, um, the vessels in between them, um, but yeah. So yeah, I think that's all the important parts off of this. Be able to identify just looking at this x-ray without these labels, like this is your humerus, this is the surgical neck, this is the anatomical neck, this is the head, this is the glenohumeral joint, this is the clavicle, this is the acromion, this is the coracoid process. Like you should, it would probably behoove you to take this slide and then um, blank out all of the labels and then see if you're able to guess correctly just being able to read the x-ray yourself. Okay. So more of the same, just in a diagram form this time. So you can see how they've spliced it here such that um, you can see here's your humerus, here's your scapula, and then here's the joint cavity of your glenohumeral joint. Here's the long head of the biceps inserting on the superior aspect. Here's your supraspinatus muscle coming over and then inserting at the top of the humerus. Here's that subacromial bursa that we talked about before. And then what else is important here? So they're trying to show you by having the cutaways here, the posterior circumflex humeral artery as well as the axillary nerve going around that surgical neck of the humerus. Um, they're showing you teres major inserting and how it's not around your rotator cuff because it is not a rotator cuff muscle. Mm. What else? I'm trying to think. I think that's like most of what they're trying to show you here is just so you get a better three dimensional view of this is the joint cavity itself. Um, seeing how the humerus articulates with the glenoid fossa of your scapula. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what is wrong with this pincher hint upper limb? Oh, so this is the whole subluxation that we talked about before, how um, you can end up with subluxation of the joint um, and how you can have the radius pop out of the annular ligament that's attached, like that connects it to the humerus. Um, so here's the distal portion of your humerus um, and the proximal portion of your radius and your ulna. So recall that your humerus articulates with your ulna via the trochlea and the trochlear notch. Well, the head of your radius has a ligament around it, that's the angular ligament, that it doesn't really articulate with the humerus, but it's attached to the humerus to keep it in line. And so when you have subluxation, you have the head of that radius popping out of alignment with your humerus. So this was the anterior view, because remember our elbows in the back versus here's our posterior view. And so this is your olecranon. So the olecranon is the actual bony part of your ulna that is your elbow. Um, you can see how you have the olecranon fossa. So while the, excuse me, while the trochlear notch is articulating with the trochlea, you can see how as the upper limb um, flattens out. So when you get full extension of that elbow, how the olecranon is gonna articulate with that olecranon fossa, or more like it's made room so like it can be snug in there. Um, yeah, I think that's important parts there. Okay, and so now this is our elbow joint where we filled in muscles and nerves and bursa to get a better idea of what it looks like um, with all the other parts there. So again, here's our lacrinon, here's our elbow, um, and you can see here's our humerus, and then here we have our bursa. So I think it's, is it called our lacrinon bursa? Cutaneous triangular surface for the lacrinon bursa. Yep, it is a lacrinon bursa. 
And again, so we have the Olecranon Bursa fluid filled sac there to help us reduce friction as uh, the bones articulate with one another. Um, and then remember, I think I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Um, when thinking about the ulnar nerve, remember, I remember that the radial nerve was smart, the ulnar nerve was stupid because the ulnar nerve passes posteriorly for the upper limb at the elbow joint so that when you bend your elbow, your ulnar nerve is actually vulnerable. So that's why when you bump your elbow, you get that whole like funny bone electric shock down your forearm. That's all ulnar nerve. So here's that medial epicondyle, the ulnar nerve passing, and then it's very easy to see here how if we have a fracture of our medial epicondyle, how we can injure that ulnar nerve. Um, let's see, what other important structures are in this picture? Um, so they're showing here your flexor digitorum profundus muscle. Recall that the ulnar half of the muscle is innervated by ulnar nerves. So they're showing you branches coming off of ulnar to do that innervation. Um, and then, so this isn't labeled, but since they have the branch coming off, I think this is supposed to be showing that the innervation of um, flexor carpi ulnaris here even though, oh yeah, okay, here it is labeled good. So this is flexor carpi ulnaris getting its innervation from ulnar nerve. So there's your flexor carpi ulnaris and the ulnar half of your flexor digitorum profundus getting their innervation from your ulnar nerve. Okay. And then they're going into other stuff about radial nerve, but I don't know how important that is for this particular slide deck because we're talking about joints. Okay, so once again, different cut sections. You can see the inside, well, a depiction of the inside of the joint. So again, here is our lacranon. Here is our trochlear notch as well as our trochlea. So you can see the articulation of the humerus with the ulna. And then you can see how we have um, our subcutaneous olecranon bursa versus our subtendinous olecranon bursa. So subcutaneous olecranon bursa, literally when you see subcutaneous, that means below the skin versus subtendinous is below the tendon. And you can see here, they're showing you the triceps and then the triceps tendon as it inserts onto the olecranon and how you have a bursa underneath the tendon to again, reduce friction when you have articulation of the two bones versus this bursa underneath, uh, excuse me, underneath the skin on top of your elbow. I think that was more for the fact that like, you know, we as humans, we do stuff with our upper limbs. Like the whole point of us having upper limbs is to bring things to our mouth so that we can like have energy. Um, so I imagine that just developed um, because, you know, it is gonna be a way to cushion the elbow when we have to move things around. That's all I got for that. Um, anything else important in this picture? So I'll also make a note here how it's showing your brachialis muscle and then cut that comes down and inserts on your ulna. So recall that your brachialis muscle, it actually hugs the humeral bone um, and it's the major flexor of your forearm. So here's the brachialis muscle hugging that humerus and then the tendon coming down and inserting on your ulna. So it's gonna get you to flex um, this forearm, thereby causing articulation in the joint capsule. And so you can see how you have um, the joint capsule surrounding this entire area of the distal portion of your humerus to allow for articulation, both flexion and extension. Okay, so again, looking at ligaments around this particular joint, I'm going to point this out again, your annular ligament of the radius. That's the one that the head of the radius, when the head of the radius pops out of this ligament, that's how you get subluxation. Um, so popping out of subluxation, dislocation is when it pops out and then moves over to the side. Um, let's see, what else is important here? So the ulnar collateral ligament, it has three parts. You have 
the anterior band, the posterior band, and the oblique band. Um, whenever you have a collateral ligament, think about stability. So there's going to be collateral ligaments in your elbow. There's collateral ligaments in your knees. Um, those are all about trying to, trying to keep this joint in line and stable. Um, what else? And then I guess the other important thing to note here, you can see how your biceps brachii tendon is inserting on your radius. So that makes sense because your biceps brachii is the major supinator um, of your forearm. So in order to supinate, it needs to pull that radius back into alignment with the humerus. So biceps brachii along with supinator to supinate uh, the forearm, pulling that radius back into alignment with the humerus. And then you can see again, your interosseous membrane between your radius and your ulna to help stabilize those two bones next to each other. And then the oblique cord, I can't ever recall coming up in a question, but it's there. So I'll just make note of it. Okay. So before I believe that was a medial view. Yes. And now this is a lateral view of the same joint. So again, they're pointing out your annual ligament that's going around the head of the radius. Um, you have the radial collateral ligament. Um, what else is important? Uh, okay, so I'll just make note of the part of the humerus that the radius lines up with is called the capitulum. Um, and I just sort of remember that it was called the capitulum because for some reason it made me think of baseball, probably because of the Washington Capitals. Um, but yes, yeah, so that rounded portion of the humerus that is aligned with the neck of the radius, excuse me, the head of the radius, that is the capitulum. Okay. And so synovial membrane of the elbow joint. Okay. So this is the actual like membrane. So when you see synovial membrane, think of production of that synovial fluid that goes into the joint that helps to um, cushion the joint and smooth out movements, <coughs> excuse me, smooth out movements of the joint. Um, again, here's your lateral and medial epicondyle. So here's that annular ligament, again, around the head of your radius. Um, yeah, that's it for that picture. Huh. So what are they showing in this one? Okay, so in this particular picture, you can see how, so this is looking down at the joint. They've taken away the humerus, they've taken away the radius, but they're still showing you the annual ligament that goes around the head of the radius. Um, they're showing you your olecranon, they're showing you this trochlear, um, the trochlear notch. Um, here. Uh, they made note of the radial notch of the ulna. So that's like the area that the ulna has hugged into the, excuse me, the area in the ulna where the radial bone has hugged into it. So that's the radial notch here. Um, and then again, your radial collateral ligament that's there at this joint to help with stability. Okay. So now we've gone down even more distally. And so now we're looking at the wrist joint. So just as a reminder, the humerus articulates with the ulna, the ulna articulates with the radius and the radius articulates with the wrist. So the radius articulates with the carpal bones. So here is our distal radius, here's our distal ulna. You can see how um, the radius is much wider here distally, which is the ulna is much skinnier and the opposite is true more proximally where you have that skinnier radius and that wider ulna. So they sort of like are the inverse of each other. Um, this is the ulna styloid process, which again can get ripped off when you break your wrist. Um, and then there's just a bunch of ligaments here that I don't recall ever coming up very often, but just knowing that they're there to help stabilize the wrist. Um, again, knowing about your carpal bones in the area. So you can see how they pointed out, here's pisiform, here's triquetrum, here's capitate. And then each of them is gonna have um, articular cartilage and joint space to help with that fluid movement of the wrist and to like cushion the different bones against each other. Here's lunate, 
Um, I can't really see Scaffold too well here, unfortunately. Um, and then you can see the styloid process of the radius. They both, both the radius and the ulna have a styloid process that sort of point out at the end. Okay, and then looking at the joints of the hand, so the actual digits themselves, you can see how here is your DIP, your distal interphalangeal joint, which you have articulation between your distal phalanx and your middle phalanx. And then here's your um, PIP, where you have articulation between your middle phalanx and your proximal phalanx. So your DIP versus your PIP. Let's see. So they talk about how you have little, well, they just point out how you have small little fossa at each of your um, distal phalangeals. Uh, I think that's phalanges, there we go. Distal phalanges, where you have insertion for the tendons of your flexor digitorum profundus to allow for flexion at the tips of your fingers. Um, and then you have fossa on the sides of your middle phalanx for the insertion of your flexor digitorum superficialis muscles. So there. Um, i trying to think what else is important here. I think those are like the biggest things is just knowing your DIP versus your PIP, as well as um, the joint in between your proximal phalanx with your metacarpals. Um, when you actually go to make a fist, those knuckles that point out, that's like your metacarpals, like the tops of your metacarpals peeking out. Okay. So this particular picture has a slice of the hand where you can see better how each of your carpal bones is surrounded by their own articular cartilage and now how you have like space and how you want to like how these are cushioned against each other as they're moving, moving because you don't want, you know, bone grinding on bone. Um, you can also see here, so the articular disc of the wrist as the carpal bones articulate with your radius. Um, I think those are the big things in this particular picture. And then this is showing you just all the different surfaces with articular cartilage and then the impressions that each of the bones makes on each other so that they can fit together and allow for that smooth movement without the grindy of bone on bone. So you can see how, for instance, how this guy sort of bubbles out and this guy concaves in, this guy sort of bubbles out and this guy concaves in, just to allow for each of the bones to be able to sit with each other and not have that grinding. Okay, and so now we're looking at the individual digits and how you have, like I already mentioned this, how is your, this is your DIP, this is your PIP, and then you have the actual articulation between the metacarpal and the proximal phalanx. Um, it's showing you a collateral ligament between your metacarpal and the proximal phalanx and how you have a cord-like part versus a fan-like part. I'm going to be completely honest, I didn't learn this specificity with the digits when we were learning about the hand. So not really sure how much I can help you with this particular picture, um, but just noting that you have one, two, three different joints with each of your um, digits two through five. Because remember your thumb only has a proximal and a distal phalanx, so it's only one joint that's actually in your thumb. And then you have the joint between the proximal phalanx and the middle, excuse me, and the metacarpal. Um, and so I guess since it's bolded, I'll just point this one out, how you have the collateral ligament on the side of the joint between your proximal phalanx and your metacarpal versus the palmar ligament is coming anteriorly to that joint. Okay. Um, 
All right, it's 11.53, so I think this will be the last slide that I talk about. Um, so again, looking at x-rays, uh, you're gonna want to quiz yourself on being able to identify the different parts on an x-ray um, of the bones that you see. So you, for here, we have our humerus coming down and then you have the medial epicondyle versus the lateral epicondyle. And you're able to distinguish between the two because remember, your ulna is more medial versus your radius is more lateral. So you can see how this will be your medial epicondyle versus your lateral epicondyle. You have the head of your radius versus the neck and then the tuberosity. Um, you have the trochlea of your humerus versus the trochlear notch that it's articulating with from the ulna. Um, what else? Um, here's the capitulum that's in line with the head of the capitulum of the humerus that's in line with the head of the radius. Um, here's your olecranon fossa where your olecranon is able to get um, in more, is able to get in alignment with the humerus when it's, the upper limb is completely extended when your elbow is completely extended. Um, and then the proximal radial humeral radial ulnar joint versus the distal radial ulnar joint. So the radius and the ulna are in like close proximity, close alignment with each other, such that they have this proximal part where they articulate with each other, and then they have the distal portion too, where they articulate with each other. Um, so yeah. Um, and yeah, it is officially 10.55 where y'all are, so I will stop. I think we got through a lot of this, hopefully, because it's a lot of slides we just went through. Um, okay, yeah, so it's only, this is like the last picture, and this is just showing supination pronation, which I've already talked about with y'all. Just how when you have supination, the bones are in alignment versus pronation, you have the radius crossing over the ulna. Okay, so I will stop sharing and I will stop recording.